ask you to stand as we begin our service this morning with 216, Look to the Lamb of God. And we'll sing all four verses, one through four, Look to the Lamb of God, 216. This morning we have a special from the children's choir. blessing. Aren't you thankful to see these young people wanting to serve the Lord? So right now, before we do anything else, I want to put before you some things about the Word of God. Uh, we were at a leadership conference toward the end of this last week. Many of you were praying for that. And one of the themes in that conference was translating the Word of God, specifically putting the Word of God into the hands of people with languages and dialects that have that, that do not have the word of God in their own language. And there are 7,000 some odd languages on the in, in the earth today. And of those languages, there are hundreds, thousands that do not have the word of God in their language still. 
And aren't you thankful that we as English speakers for the past four or five hundred years have been able to open the Word of God and be able to see clearly through a window into God's Word? God has preserved His Word for us. And so I'd like to introduce to you Brother Bandemir, who's here with us this morning. He's going to come and share with you. He works with the Gideons, and you're familiar with them if you've seen their Bibles in any of the drawers of the hotels, the things maybe you visited. Uh, they leave those, and uh, there's so many testimonies that could be shared. But before we take any more time, I want to uh, have Brother Bandemir come and walk through what the Gideons do. And so let's welcome him as he shares with us what they do. Thank you, Pastor Jason. Well, I just... Uh... Always appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you all what uh, the Lord's doing through the Gideon ministry uh, around the world. And so uh, my uh, my outlay this morning, I, I just want to give you a, a, a little bit of the big picture, some of the local picture, and then why is all that important. On the big picture, the Gideons uh, currently are in over 200 uh, countries, territories, and possessions. Uh, so we are uh, literally uh, a worldwide organization. Um, obviously, COVID has affected our operation and, and our uh, getting the scriptures out in a, in a terrible way as far as 2020 was concerned. Before COVID, we were averaging about 29 million scriptures being handed out uh, per year. Uh, obviously 2020, that number went way down, but we are back up to set over 17 million uh, scriptures that we're getting out there. And so uh, the Lord is blessing and we're getting back into operations and uh, with, uh, with so many um, difficulties that we do face. So on the big picture, God is doing some wonderful things. Uh, but what is that? How does that come down to our local area? Well, um, our camp uh, is the Denver North Camp, and we basically go from uh, I up I-25 all the way to Highway 7, across uh, Highway 7 to 287, and back down to Highway 36. So we, ha we have a fairly large area that we deal with, and uh, we're, um, we're involved in making sure in that area that we get all of our hotels, uh, the Bibles, in the hotels. Last year when I was here and did the report I was sharing with you that COVID had just really decimated us in getting being, and being able to put Bibles in hotels. And I'm, I'm just want to, I just want to praise the Lord. Our camp has been diligent. We've been out there working with these hotels. And at this point we have 87% of our, our hotels that have allowed us to get back in. So God has been good there, uh, taking a lot of work, but, um, but we ha do have those Bibles uh, back in most of our hotels in this area. Uh, schools, we're out there handing out Bibles to our uh, junior high, high schools and the college age. And I can, I can personally report to you that the kids are responding in a great way. Um, they take those Bibles, and, and, and it's just fun to watch some of them sit down on the curb and just start reading it. Um, and so God is working in kids' hearts. Now, staff and professors in the colleges and so forth continue to give us a lot of grief, but that's all right. Uh, you know, we can, uh, we can handle their, their uh, pushback, and uh, God is, has been good to see the kids take these Bibles. Um, so I just wanted to uh, say, as far as our camp is concerned, we uh, have 56 members in our camp, and uh, we have every Saturday morning to when we get together for our prayer time to pray for your, our pastors and our churches and, and the ministry itself, we usually average uh, 10 to 15 guys. So uh, the Lord has uh, blessed our camp. Uh, so I just wanted to share with you a little bit about who uh, the Gideons are. We're a lay professional layman's uh, organization whose um, uh, goal is to get God's word into the hands of boys and girls uh, and adults around the world. But to be a Gideon, uh, you need to be an, uh, a, a person in good standing and recommended by a pastor of a church that's committed to these basically six things. And I think as I go through these six things, you're going to see where we as an organization are beginning to get buffeted. Um, number one, uh, a church that is committed to God's word, that it's the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. And I don't know if uh, it's, it's, as we get around to all of our churches, it's amazing how many churches today are beginning to fall away uh, from that concept that God's word is God's word. That's what it is. 
And uh, so um, uh, Gideon must believe that, uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God and have, has uh, a personal relationship with him and uh, can give a testimony that he's trusted Christ as his personal Savior and that he's endeavoring to follow him in his daily life. Um, it does no good if you, you want to uh, trust Christ your Savior and go out and live like, live like the devil. But um, uh, the, these last two are the ones that uh, we're really getting a lot of pushback on. Um, number five is that you must believe in the endless lake of fire for the unsaved. And it's unbelievable in today's world how many people God is love, and he is. God is love, and he's merciful, but he's also holy, and he's also just. And, uh, you know, you, you, when you try to get people, to uh, guys to join the Gideons, and they just simply want to look at God's love and, and throw out this uh, idea that uh, there is a lake of fire for the unsaved, you say, have you ever read Revelation 10 to 15? Uh, it'll explain that to you. So uh, that one it makes it a little bit difficult for us to get some of these applicants in. Uh, the last one uh, is that we get, you must accept the biblical standard of marriage between one man and one woman. Um, and that one uh, tends to make it very difficult because uh, guys today, and it's amazing how our society has opened up to this concept of, well, God loves everybody, and he does. But there are some things that, um, that is just an abomination to God. And um, we just cannot have that in our organization. So uh, when we look at uh, these, these concepts uh, that we um, require for a person to be a, a Gideon, um, some, of these la some of these things are beginning to uh, affect us. Now, as far as the Gideon organization is concerned, the average age of a Gideon is uh, 64 and a half years old. And uh, our, our membership is down almost, almost 32%. And the reason being, uh, when you get up in that age group, which age group did COVID hit the hardest? Uh, so we've got a lot of our members that have graduated. They've gone on to, to glory. And when you get into these younger guys trying to come in and wanting them to bring, bring in, um, meeting these concepts, these, these re agreeing to these uh, requirements uh, makes it a little bit difficult, but uh, it's amazing there are some young guys out there. There are some people out there uh, that are willing to commit to God's Word. So why is God's Word so important to us? Uh, when you look at the fact that that is God's infallible, inerrant Word of God, uh, as I tell young people when we hand them a testament, and if we get a chance to talk to them as we're doing that, I always tell them, you know, the reason this book is so important to you is when you, we stand before the Lord someday, uh, and we're all going to stand before him uh, sometime in, our, uh, in, in eternity. Are you going to stand there before the, the Lord and say, well, my parents taught me, my church taught me, or I was... I was um, serious about whatever you, path you, you followed uh, to try to get to heaven. Uh, you know what God's going to do? He's going to look at you in the eye and say, but what did I tell you? And this book is God's word. And um, you, can, you can take it and, and know that God does not lie. And his word is true. And so you better look at what God tells you, not what man tells you, not what a religion will tell you, but what God tells you. And uh, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him, not in a religion, not in a church, but believes in him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we are committed to getting God's word in, into the hands of boys, girls, men and women around the world and I'd just like to read a couple of testimonies of how God's Word works in, in lives. Uh, this one says, I received a New Testament at school, but my father forbade me to read it. Then my family disowned me, and I had to seek out jobs to support myself. During this difficult time, I continued to read my New Testament, and I gave my heart to the Lord, and today I'm a pastor. Um, just one other one. I was raised in the church. 
but I drifted away from my faith while attending a very liberal college. And I was just talking to one of your gentlemen here, I guess one of your, your seminars was about uh, getting uh, um, st Bible studies into colleges. And that's such an important place to reach our young people. That's where we lose them, is when they go off to college. And that's the same way with this young young person here. And one day I was, uh, as I was crossing the campus, a Gideon handed me a small New Testament. I began reading it each day and reaffirmed my commitment to the Lord. After graduation, I went into full-time Christian service. And we get those kind of letters uh, every week uh, coming in how God has worked in hearts and lives just, just by his word working and God the Holy Spirit moving in hearts. I was able this week to send Pastor a, a video of what God's doing in India. God is doing amazing things in India with, um, with the Gideons over there. Uh, I believe so far this year, if my numbers are correct, we've, spent, we've uh, sent about 4.5 million Bibles to India. And God is just moving in hearts over there. Well, you know, you say, uh, guys, uh, maybe I'd be interested in that, but I'm too old. What did I say the average age was? Uh, you know, uh, I'm 74, and God can use you at whatever age. You don't have to be a young person. Uh, how can God use you? If you're interested in the Gideon ministry, would uh, like to talk to me about perhaps joining us and uh, being able to see the excitement of handing a Bible to a young person, uh, to a college student, or putting those Bibles in, in, in our hotels. Let me know. We'd be glad to talk to you. Thank you, Pastor. Lord bless. Thank you, Brother Bandemir. And I also want to say that here at the church in particular, we do believe in the authorized version that's perfectly preserved and inspired for us. Um, we've had this for hundreds of years, and all the major revivals have come through the authorized version. And, it, and it's such a, a transparent window, just, just as clear as you can get into the original languages. And so we have a special relationship with the Gideons, in case you might be wondering with that. Uh, what we do support them, we make sure it goes to authorized version translations. And so they work with us on that. They're glad to do that. And, and we're glad to be able to work with them because we need more of the Word of God going out. And that's why we have a seed line ministry here at the church. And if you're not involved in that, let me encourage you, come and staple some covers on some New Testaments, some John and Romans, and let's put these in the hands of people that do not have them yet. We take it for granted that we get to open the Word of God and read. For God so loved the world. And how many times would somebody love to have that message in their own tongue? And we're working frantically to translate that into new tongues, but that's a, that's a challenge in and of itself. So one other thing before we pray I'd like to do here. If, uh, if you have served in any branch of our military or armed forces, or if a um, primary family member, a direct family member, maybe your mom, maybe your dad, maybe a brother or sister, that, that direct family member, uh, if they have served, we'd like to honor you. And if you would be so kind to stand and just let us acknowledge you because it'll be Veterans Day this week. And if you've served in our military, the reason we have the freedom to be able to hand out the word of God to be able to make sure the Bible goes through our country and around the world. The reason that America stays free is because of the price that these have paid. And so we want to honor you and say thank you from the depths of our heart. You don't know how much you mean to us because of the freedom we have. Uh, you have given your time. You have given uh, your service to our country to keep us free. And with a heartfelt gratitude, we say a deep, deep thank you. Thank you for serving, for your time there. And so let's give them a round of applause. So I've mentioned our prayer requests, and God has heard all that has been said. So let's just pray a brief prayer over all these things. And you pray as the Lord leads there in your seat, and we'll continue in our service. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for each one that has just stood in our midst not ashamed of our country, not ashamed of the gospel of Christ even. And Lord, there are many that are serving today that are paying a severe cost for their faith. We lift them up, Lord, but anyone that's serving our country in any capacity, we want to honor them, Lord. We pray your protection on them and your blessing on their families. We thank you, Lord, that because of the freedoms of this country, we get to hear from people like Brother Bandemir about how the Word of God is going forth. We get to have a seed line ministry in our church where we can help the Word of God 
uh, be put in people's hands that could lead them to the truth of your word for salvation. Lord, we want people to be saved. We want them to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And how powerful can that be when someone who lives the faith hands a copy of your word to them, opens it before their eyes and explains to them person to person how they can know you as their savior. What a precious thing, Lord, when when one of your messengers brought your word to me as a 14 year old young man and I trusted you as my savior and I knew my sins were washed away, put under the blood. Lord, thank you for Calvary. Thank you for our country. Thank you for our families, for our homes. For everyone that's here today, Lord, we pray your blessing on this service and those that might be battling illness. I pray, Lord, that you would touch them and be with them. Give them your touch and bring them to wellness very quickly, Lord. Give them wholeness in their in their physical body and in their spiritual walk with you. May your grace be upon them for those that might need comfort. Lord, we ask you to visit them as the, the paraclete, the one who's called alongside them to help carry these burdens. And we cast our care on you for you care for us. Lord, we pray for uh, just the well-being of our church family and all those that are connected with the various ministries here. Not just our church family, Lord, other sister churches along the front range around the state and across the country. Lord, I pray that your people everywhere would be banded together even stronger for the work of the ministry to see your church empowered by the Holy Spirit and strengthened to take your word to a lost and dying generation. Lord, they need the truth of your word. And we're going to open that here later in this service. And we're going to hear the truth from your word. And sometimes, Lord, it may not be uh, what we want to hear, but it's what we need to hear. And I pray that as the word of God goes forth today, it would do a work in our lives that you'd bless Pastor Ward as he preaches, that you'd bless the rest of the songs, Lord, that it would stir our hearts to think about what you've done for us in giving us your wonderful revelation in the word of God. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings and pray it upon the rest of this service and our church family. In Jesus' name we do pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. At this time, I'm going to ask Brother Tim Sinks to come back and lead us in a couple more songs. 212, nothing but the blood. And that's what we preach here. It's nothing but the blood of Jesus that can wash away our sins. Brother Tim leads us in our music here. Uh, You pray for him and he's going to come. Let's join him in song. You've been singing for a while, so go ahead and stand with us as we sing nothing but the blood. Brother Tim. 212 in your hymn books. Sing all four verses, please. 212. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. the land. 
will sing 208, Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb? Page 208. And sing all four verses, please. This time, I'd like to introduce uh, to those who might not know him, uh, Brother Andy Summers. He helps with our youth around here, and it's a great segue from these testimonies right into him coming and leading us in a scripture reading in the Word of God. And it'll be found in 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. We'll be reading verses 1 through 14 together. Uh, Brother Andy will lead us in those verses, 2 Samuel chapter 12. And if the congregation could be so kind as to read responsively out loud, on verse number seven, verse number seven, you'll read that verse out loud once we come to that place. If you found your place in the word of God and if you're physically able, we invite you to stand out of reverence for the reading of God's holy word today. Brother Andy Summers, you come and lead us. Thank you, Pastor. Before I read, I just want to share that we've partnered with the Gideons for many years. Personally, they do have cards in memory of, and we, instead of sending flowers, which die in a matter of days, have chosen in memory of our friends and parents of friends who have died to send a card from the Gideons that they provide and have a Bible placed in their memory. And the rack is in the back with those cards. And it's been a huge blessing to others to know that there's a word of God that is out there in memory of their parents or their loved one that has died that is living. The word of God is living and going on in memory of their loved one. So there's lots of opportunities like that to get the word of God out through the seed line and, and through the Gideons, please uh, be a part of that. Let's read 2 Samuel chapter 12. We're going to read verse 1 through 14. As pastor said, read verse 7 with me when we get to that. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it 
for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Please read with me verse 7. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had not been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such a thing. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will rise up evil against thee out of thine house, own house and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the examples of both good and bad, but most importantly here of the repentance that came as David was confronted. Help us to apply these things as pastor expounds on them. Lord, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated.
Amen. Wasn't that wonderful? We'll have our children dismissed to children's services. First times that I actually remembered, except Pastor Jason reminded me anyways, because <laughs> he knows I usually don't. All right. Well, as in our moment, uh, scripture moment, uh, we've already read 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 14, which is going to be the majority of, uh, of my text this morning. But I'd like you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13. Uh, this will give us some additional context. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13. While you're turning there, I see uh, we've got so many wonderful things going on with testimonies, with uh, Gideon's presentation, with special music. I've really got a lot to preach in a short period of time. And so uh, did you bring a pack, a sack lunch? Oh, uh, I don't see many, so I guess not. So I'll just have to do the best I can. Chapter 13, verse 8 through 14. And this is speaking of uh, King Saul. And, you know, King Saul started off good, but things didn't stay that way. Uh, sin was a problem in his life as it is in many people's lives. And sometimes we think we get away with it. Nobody saw it. And so we we'll see in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 8 through 14, it says, And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. What do we see here? Is that Saul is a king, he is not a priest. And so he overstepped his bounds. He didn't listen to the prophet. You go, oh, well, the prophet's not here. Maybe he's not showing. So he did something that he wasn't supposed to do. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering and burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me. Uh-oh, here comes the excuses. And that thou camest not within the days appointed. Oh, now it's the prophet's fault. And that the Philistines gathered themselves together in Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore. Interesting. Sound familiar in your own life occasionally? Uh-oh, got kind of quiet. And offered a burnt offering, and Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. He was to be the king, and because of sin, who he thought he could get away with, he might, he's going to lose the kingdom. There are consequences to sin in our lives. The Lord sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, and because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And then in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, and maybe you'll see where I'm going on this, chapter 15, verses 1 through 23, it says, Samuel also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that, uh, that which uh, Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt, and go smite, the, uh, smite Amalek, and utter, utterly destroy all they have, and spare them not." Pretty harsh judgment. But slay both men and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, cam camel and ass. Everything is to be wiped out. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telamim, 200,000 footmen, 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart. Get you down from among the Amalekites, I I, uh, lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. 
So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah unto thou camest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would thou not utterly destroy them? Do we see another sin going against the word of God? But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and is gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be, what? Consumed. What does that mean? Destroyed. Utterly destroyed. Nothing to be allowed alive. Wherefore, then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Al uh, uh, Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. What did I often say that, what is partial obedience? Disobedience. That's exactly what on here. Oh, oh I, I did what you said, partly. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to, be, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Interesting. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, God, again, thank you for another glorious day. I pray that, Father, through the songs and the testimony and every area of this ministry that you have been honored today, that we are truly worshiping you. Now, Father, we pray that through your word, we might glean something that might speak to our hearts, that we might learn something that we would apply in our lives. For, Father, we are sinners, saved by grace, but still sinners. And sometimes we think we can get away with things because no one knows them and that you might wink at our sin. But Father, we know better. So speak to our hearts this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We pick on David a lot for what he's done. His two big sins, murder, adultery, and he thought he got away with it. 
As many times when we sin, we think we get away with some things. Oh, well, no one else knows. Well, I know what's in my mind, and I know the things I think. You may not, but I do. And I think I got away with it. And then God does something. God shows up, and he says, I know what you were thinking. And it's wrong. It's still sin. And it will be dealt with. And so I entitled this message, Sin Ignored Will Be Revealed. David ignored his own sin. He did what many of us will do with sin in our lives, is many times justify it. And then just move on as though nothing happened because, well, you know, no one else knows. David, a man after God's own heart, ignored his own sins and found out that sin ignored will be revealed to God and will also be to others. And in this case, the prophet Nathan. And there's a number of lessons here. We could go, th- I could spend the next whole day talking about this. But I I hope to touch on a few things that might remind us when we really think that we've gotten away with some things that we haven't. And that partial obedience is still disobedience. And God does not look kindly on disobedience. It's rebellion. And we saw in our text that God does not look kindly on rebellion. There are many lessons, but we'll begin with this first, is that sin is never done in secret, though we may think that it is. Las Vegas, what do they call that, Sin City? And they say, whatever we do here stays here. What are they saying? Your sin is our secret. Isn't that what's going on? We do that ourselves outside of Las Vegas. David tried to hide his sin, yet it was known by more than just himself. He thought, well, I'm the only one that knows. Well, didn't Joab know? He sent Joab to send a message to the army to have Uriah killed. And the adultery that he committed, he thought no one knows. Messengers knew. Captains knew. Joab knew. And he thought, well, they'll keep their mouths shut if they knew it all. He thought he did his sin secretly. But several knew and understood. And we can see that in chapter 11, verse 14 and 15. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to read uh, all the scriptures that I'd like to share with you. But if... We sin, others know of our secret. It comes out. It always will come out. Are we not seeing it on the news today? The secrets that they had for four years, running around our government and by our politicians, starting to come out. They thought, oh man, we got away with this. Well, maybe they have. Maybe they haven't. Somebody will always know or always find out. If we can know, if we can find out, then what about God? Is God not an omniscient God? He knows everything. There's nothing new to Him. If there's something new that He doesn't know, then He's not God. And our God is omniscient. He knows, and therefore, you can't hide your sin from Him no matter what you do. You can do your sin in a box all by yourself. God knows. And many times others do as well. It was known of God and it uh, displeased him. In 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 27, and it's important to see that. In 2 Samuel eleven twenty-seven, 27, He said, and when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife, speaking of Bathsheba, 
and bear his son, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. God doesn't wink at our sin. It displeases him. So much so that sin has separated us from God. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ was sent to this earth so that man could be reconciled back to him. That Jesus Christ would be born and live a human life perfectly, sinlessly. Die on the cross at Calvary, bearing our sins as a sin sacrifice, but rising from the grave, proving that we can have salvation and eternal life through Jesus Christ. It was accepted of God that we can be reconciled back to Him. God does want to reconcile us to Himself, but if we continue in our sin and don't deal with it, there'll be consequences. Because he's a just God, a holy God. David tried to justify or dismiss the sin in his own mind. He ignored it. He shut it out of his mind. He ignored his sin but was ready to punish the offender. Remember with Nathan and his parable about the little lamb, it says, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock, of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was to come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he said, Restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Have there ever been a time in your life when you had a sin? It doesn't matter. Small, great, it's really immaterial. And you push it out of your mind, you ignore it. Or you go around and you justify it. Well, you know, it's, that's only a little thing. No one else knows. But then God, through His Holy Spirit convicts you, and he says, Thou art the man. I'm talking to you. That's us. Even those of us in Jesus Christ, we're still sinners, saved by grace. But maybe there's someone here tonight that has not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and they're still in their sin. They've hidden it. Oh, I got by with it. There's no getting away with it from a holy God. He knows your sin. And he's revealed you through this word. He's revealed to you. Thou art the man. I'm talking to you. What are you going to do about it? David knew of his sin, thought he could get away with it. So much so, he just put it out of his mind. He went back to his throne. And he continued living as though nothing happened until the prophet Nathan came to him and told him that parable. Sin ignored and forgotten will often lead to hypocrisy. David demanded justice for the poor man in the parable, yet not for himself. Is not that what we often see in others? And if we're honest in our own selves, we demand justice except of ourselves. Oh, man, I want justice. And then they go, yo, what about you? Well, that's different. We hear that. Are we not hearing that today? Even turn on the TV, read the newspaper. We're seeing that same thing carried out, sometimes in our own lives. But it finally brought David to the point that he finally admitted his sin and confessed it and repented of it to the Lord. 
Much like the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, who confessed to his father and was forgiven and restored to fellowship. That's what God wants to do for us. But if you don't confess it, you don't do anything with it, you don't repent of your sin, then we're still separated from him. Now for a believer, our sins are under the blood. But our relationship has been strained because of sin. We need to get right with him. That's why he gave us 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That we can get back to a right relationship with him. And this is what's happening with David. Is that he had to acknowledge his sin. And then he needed to do something about it. He needed to confess it to God. Not that God didn't know. God sent Nathan the prophet to remind him of his sin, that he would acknowledge it, that he would do something about it so he could forgive him and that their relationship could be all it was supposed to be, a man after God's own heart. No matter how good we are, no matter how much we love the Lord, we're going to sin in this life. But God wants to restore us back to that fellowship that we initially had the moment we got saved. God restored David to fellowship, but he still had to suffer the consequences of his sin. You think, well, I got right with God, so we're good to go. Sin has consequences. I preached a message on this some time ago. You can't get away with your sin. There are still consequences. There are consequences for good decisions. There's consequences for bad decisions. There are consequences for no decisions. And when we sin, there will be a consequence. God just doesn't take it away. We'll still answer for it one way or another. God does forgive. Nevertheless, there are consequences. First, to the sinner, in this case, David. His sin affected him personally. There was fallout well into the future. He lost a baby, was killed because of it. But there are many other things that went on within his family life that turned against him. He was out of fellowship with the Lord. And until he got right, his life had become a life like the world. He started to live like the world. I'm above it. I'm king. I don't have to go to war in the season of war. So I'll stay home. Send out my soldiers. But then it was a temptation to him. He went up and he looked out onto the rooftop and saw Bathsheba. Well, I'm king. I can do what I want. But there are consequences. And it affected Bathsheba. It affected him. It affected his children. It affected his nation. His sin, though in America, a sin of adultery is no big deal. But it has far-reaching consequences. It doesn't ever affect just us. It affected others. It affected Uriah, a good man, though a foreigner, a Gentile, but fought honorably for King David. He not only uh, had his bride stolen away from him, but then he was sent to the hottest part of the battle to be killed because David couldn't talk him into being a dishonorable man. And so he sent him out. Well, I'll just get him killed. Well, Joab knew that. Others knew that. God knew it. It affected all the people or many people around him. He not only set up Uriah, then he murdered him. And then other innocents were killed. The soldiers that were sent to the hottest part of the battle, he didn't just send Uriah. He sent these other soldiers to do their job. And they were killed. It wasn't anyone's fault but David's. Because of his consequences for his sin. Uriah was a good man, faithful and loyal. He wouldn't go home to his wife while his men were still in battle. 
yet he allowed, yet God allowed David's sin to have him killed. Doesn't seem fair, does it? There are consequences to sin in our lives. That's why it needs to be dealt with as best we can. And then we need to be like David down the road, understood that the judgments that God pronounced upon him, he no longer would get mad at God about it because it was on him. These are consequences of my sin. Sometimes we need to get to that same place in our own lives when we do recognize our sin, get right with God, but then bear up under the burden of the consequences of our sin. God will get us through it. He has forgiven us of those things, but we still will suffer because of it as well as others. That's why it's to be very careful to not fall into the temptation to sin when it presents itself. When the devil jumps up on your shoulder, so to speak, and whispers that little word in your ear that often happens to me on Monday mornings. Pastor Jason didn't shake my hand. He must be mad at you. And I go, oh, yeah, that's right, he didn't. I don't bother to stop to think, well, he was having a cold and he didn't want me to get his cold. I just saw, he didn't shake my hand. He must be mad. And you know what? Then, then Brother Tim didn't shake my hand either. Oh, no. And then Melissa, she didn't shake my hand. Oh, no, I'm going to lose my church. The devil whispers those things. He knows our buttons and he pushes them. And then he brings us in that place where we sin. And you might say, well, what's your sin? And my sin is that I'm not trusting God. If I lose my church, that's God's business. It might be my fault, but that's still God's business. My lack of faith is a sin against him. let alone all the other kinds of sins that rear their ugly heads throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month, all of those things that happen in all of our lives, and we'll have to suffer the consequences. His son, David's son, Absalom, who he loved, his favorite son, rebelled against him, tried to take his own life. How about if your own parents tried to or you would, or that your own children would go against you as parents. It would break your heart. You would even have, in this case, have to go to war against him. It, it affected the entire army and how they went to war. Sin has far-reaching consequences. Bathsheba added to his harem, so to speak, his concubines and wives. Why did David not have just one wife? It caused a whole lot of problems. It's to be one man and one woman. Though it's in the Bible, doesn't mean God condones it. And because he had multiple wives and a, a number of children, all kinds of things came out of that. Bad choices because of sin had far-reaching effects in the entire family. And it does in our lives as well. Divorce doesn't happen just to one person. Adultery doesn't happen to just one person and the consequences of it. It never does. It affects everyone. I was going to give a bunch of examples, but we don't need more examples. You know where I'm coming from on this. But here's the great part of this whole message. Is that through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, sin can be forgiven. And he can forget it. We don't. God removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. He forgives it. He forgets it puts it aside where it has no effect. Because when there is confession and repentance of our sin, God will forgive us. No matter what that sin is. The little white sin that we all do so frequently because it's only a little white sin. 
or the big sins, murder and rape and adultery, but they're still sin. And they all affect our relationship with God. But he wants to forgive us. He wants to forgive you of those little so thinking sins in your mind that no one else knows about. God don't even know. Yes, he does. Yeah, we, uh, I think I laugh too in my own mind, but it's so true. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 tells us that if thou shalt confess or acknowledge with my mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you can finish it, thou what? Shalt be saved. You have to acknowledge your sin first as David had to acknowledge it. But it has to be revealed. And God revealed to him through a prophet. God reveals it to his people today through his Holy Spirit. In chapter 16, convicts us of our sin. That we know that we need a Savior. Or that we know that because of our Savior, we need to get right with him. That we need to restore our fellowship. I spend much time, I'm sure Pastor Jason does as well, and maybe many of you here today, but we spend much time at night and early in the morning praying and trying to remember anything that we may have sinned, even if out of ignorance, that did not hinder the going forth of the Word of God, that did not hinder the ministry here today, that we can confess it to Him and repent of it, that we can move forward, that did not hinder our prayers, that did not hinder the service, that did not hinder our worship to God. It needs to be dealt with. Repentance and forgiveness are required of us by God. Luke 17, 3, it says, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. As God forgives us, we need to forgive others. But there needs to be some repentance. But there won't be repentance without confession. But once we're forgiven, we can then be restored. David prayed and fasted and wept while his son was alive, when it was, his baby was still alive in chapter 11, verse 18 to 29. And then when his son died, he cleaned himself up and he moved on. And why? Because there was no more he could do. Sometimes you got to bear up under the load of your sin, the consequences of it, and then suck it up and move on. He took it to God. And God forgave him. And he bore the consequences. And then it was time, okay, to just move on for the Lord. And then he was a man after God's own heart. It, he didn't allow that sin, the guilt of sin, to keep him from living for God for the rest of his life. Don't let your sin, once you confess it and repent of it, it's gone. Amen. Then move on for the Lord. Don't carry the guilt with you. When you come up to the altar, if you come up to the altar, take your bag of sin with you, but leave it here. Don't take it home with you. It'll keep you from saving, serving the Lord. Be like David, the man after God's own heart. Because once we're forgiven, we've, we're restored. I like in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, just paraphrasing a couple words of that verse, that the spiritual man, those who think they're spiritual, are to what? Restore such an one. It's all about restoration. God wants to restore our fellowship with Him. We are to restore fellowship one with another. But without dealing with the sin that we might have hidden in our heart or in the back of our minds, we'll struggle and there'll be consequences. Sin that's ignored will be revealed because God wants us to deal with it. And first, it needs to be dealt with through Jesus Christ. Receiving Him as our Lord and Savior. Accepting His 
sacrifice that he's done in our place. That we then can be restored to fellowship first with God, but then so that we can then learn to love one another and get our relationships right one with another. Sin ignored will be revealed. What are you going to do about it? Let's close in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, God, again, we thank you for your word. And Lord, you know that I had much prepared, but for the sake of time, I believe I said what needed to be said, and I pray you'll use it. For Father, it's your word. And I thank you so much for forgiving me of my sins. Oh, what Jesus has done for me was I shook my fist in your face for so many years. Forgive me. I know you have, but I still struggle with the guilt of those poor choices and decisions. But I had to come to that place where you revealed the sin in my life and the future consequences. Thank you for what you've done. But Father, if there's one here today that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they're still in their sin. And even if no one else seems to know about it, you do. And it will separate them from you forever in that place called hell and ultimately the lake of fire. If there's one like that today, I pray, Father, they would come forth and bow a knee and through your word we can show them how to be saved, how to be forgiven, how to be reconciled to you. But Father, for the rest of us, help us to deal with sin in our lives. Those little sins, those sins day by day that we think we get away with. Others know about them, but you know about them. Help us today to deal with those sins. Confess them, repent of them, that we might be forgiven and restored in perfect harmony and fellowship. Speak to the hearts of your people today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed and eyes closed, no looking around. This is your opportunity to respond to the message there at your seat, here by the pulpit. The invitation time is yours. God's people said what? Amen. Amen. The word of God is powerful. And sometimes we need to be reminded. Our country is stug struggling for what it is going through now because it has not confessed its sins. It's nat national sins. They need to be confessed and repented of. And God will forgive us as a nation. We've got a lot of work ahead of us.